website about partnering with procurement um, and some tips and tricks for doing that. Um, that is a little more comprehensive than we'll be deep diving into today. And so I encourage you to go there um, when you're procuring IT and check out um, some ideas and a lot of the great information they have on doing that. Um, high level, some of the most important things to do when you're thinking about buying IT in general is um, first off to solicit accessibility information from your vendor. And, you know, what can they do? What do they currently have? Um, what are their current capabilities? And then second, to validate that in information that's received. Um, and if you need help with that, that's part of what the accessibility team does and has information on, on their website as well. And then including accessibility assurances in contracts. Um, while it's awesome to you know, solicit and validate their accessibility, um, as we all kind of know in a contract itself, um, what's the requirements that are actually in the contract are the best part. And that's what's going to actually put some teeth into it because if what the vendor has could possibly change tomorrow. And so if the accessibility assurances are not physically in the contract and something changes, then you have no recourse. Um, it's a lot like if you hired someone to paint your um, office and you said, okay, I would like the walls white. And the contract said, we're going to paint white walls. And that's great. And if they didn't paint those walls white, say you came in and those walls were red and you really didn't want red walls in your office, um, you could point to that contract and go, that's not the color we agreed upon. Um, that's not what we talked about. Whereas if your contract didn't say that at all and it just said paint um, and they painted it any old color they wanted, then you would have no recourse to come back to that contractor and go, wow, we didn't talk about your red walls were not at all what we talked about. You know, you need to change that at your expense because that's not what we agreed upon. So having it actually in the contract makes us have some recourse and it also has accountability for the vendor for what they say they're going to do and what they can do. Um, otherwise, it's more of a handshake informal type of deal where that's nice, but you can't really do anything about it if it doesn't happen. Uh, next slide, please. And partnering with stakeholders is really key and that's what our team does. Um, most of the people on this call um, and viewing right now are stakeholders. We consider those our internal and external partners and doing that early is best. If you're not early, you're late um, because if you don't start at the beginning, then you're kind of scrambling at the end, trying to get things done. Um, engaging people as early as possible is key. And getting involved in the process from a procurement standpoint before a final decision is made. Um, because, you know, like today is a great example. It's biennium close. And, you know, someone says, oh, we want to hire this vendor and this needs to be signed today. We have a deadline in two hours. Can you please do that? Um, our chances of getting accessibility in and having that conversation and being successful is pretty low at that point because we're under a deadline. Either the solution might get unplugged, um, might not get renewed, someone's budget might expire. And then we don't have that. We've lost all of those opportunities. It's kind of like shopping for a car when your current car is broken down. You don't have a lot of leverage. You need a car, you have to get places. Um, and so your options are dramatically decreased um, in your negotiating power. You're pretty much stuck. And so getting a seat at the table when selecting vendors is really good. Um, Terrell and I recently did that. We had a department looking at an enterprise solution and Terrell um, was able to talk to them um, in the early in the selection process to say, you know, this is gonna be a big solution um, what about accessibility? Because this is going to have wide visibility for all of our campus and high exposure as well. And this is important even on non-high exposure items, but being able to, you know, from a procurement and an accessibility standpoint, making sure that they're involved so that if the vendor has questions um, and doesn't understand what we're asking for um, on the front end, that we can assist with that and facilitate that on the front end. 
and then involving our other process partners besides accessibility and keeping that holistic um, view of the process um, is good as well, because we also have our Chief Information Services Office, also called the CISO's Office, and privacy as well. And so there's a lot of um, pieces that are involved when we start thinking about buying specifically IT solutions. And next slide, please. And accessibility as a standard, when you're incorporating it into your processes, where does it fit in? How do we do this? And so what we do at the University of Washington is we have um, general, what we call general terms and conditions that we attach to all of our orders. And those are the accessibility language is and a link to our policies is embedded into our boilerplate terms and conditions and our website information. And so anything that we send out to vendors as a standard already has that built in. So it's not manual, it's not dependent on memory or process um, or an afterthought. It's basically, this is our baseline standard that we expect from all vendors. And we include the writers and terms in all of our RFPs that we do and solicitations regardless of size. And so we don't go, you know, we don't have any type of parameters say, oh, if it's over $10,000 or, oh, if it's more than 10 users, um, accessibility is important regardless of the size of the contract, regardless of dollar value. And so that's standard for everything that we do. It's basically policy. Um, we do standard training for all of our procurement team members on all of our writers and accessibility. Um, since we're essentially, um, the last stop in checking everything and making sure it's correct. All of our team receives standard training to make sure that all of these things happen. Um, and then once a vendor is selected, if there are any concerns or questions with the vendor or um, they're struggling with accessibility or our requirements, we partner with our accessibility team to vet those vendors prior to them being approved for use. And Terrell and his team are really instrumental for us in answering vendor questions, being able to ask the right questions and evaluating them to ensure that what they're telling us is correct. And if there are any gaps in either um, their VPAT or our understanding in um, closing those gaps and making sure everybody understands. And then if there's any deviations, you know, say there's only one vendor in the market, which is always an unfortunate situation, um, that, and we have to use that vendor and there's no other choice, that somebody with executive authority is reviewing that and understanding what you're agreeing to. Um, oftentimes, because their department is actually the ones who are gonna take on that risk in the event something happens or there is an accessibility issue that gets escalated, um, you know, to the legal level or otherwise. And so somebody, you know, at a director or EVP level should be looking at that since they are also the sponsors of accessibility um, at the university as well. And so that shouldn't be somebody, you know, I've been at the university for two days, someone hired me to do data entry for POs and sure, I'll approve that this vendor can't be accessible. You know, it doesn't, that's not really equitable or appropriate um, for someone to make those type of decisions. And so those deviations really should be the person with the ethical and fiscal responsibility at the university. And this next slide, we're gonna turn it over to Terrell and he's gonna start talking about the rest of the accessibility pieces. So thank you, Terrell. Great, thanks, Lynn. So the, um, the rest of this presentation, it actually is an encore presentation. Um, this is uh, something that I gave at um, uh, Tech Connect um, about a month ago or so. And then Lynn and I um, gave this entire presentation to um, a group of uh, city and county uh, representatives last week. Um, but what we found is that it um, we could e very easily use a lot more time than we had in those uh, venues. And so we booked this as a two hour presentation, but probably it's going to be closer to one hour. Um, but uh, we do have uh, some room a full hour if we need it to go over and to have some discussion and so forth. And we also have a number of examples we want to look at at the end. So 
the uh, kind of the purpose um, of this presentation and the reason that it came about is because um, now that we do have um, IT accessibility and an IT accessibility rider that is part of the, the standard UW terms and conditions, um, more, more and more procurement is including accessibility, which is great. So that first step in the um, Lynn's first slide that listed the three steps, the first step was to solicit accessibility information. That actually is happening. If IT is being procured through procurement services, then um, that always um, happens. That um, the uh, bidders for a, for a solicitation are asked about accessibility. Um, so the next piece then, step number two, is verifying the information that they provide. And as Lynn has said, uh, my team, um, we are, I should say a little bit more about my team, I guess, we are um, accessible technology services. So we're a small department within UWIT. And I supervise a team of four full-time employees. And then there are a couple of other people that dedicate a portion of their position to the work that we do. But we're a pretty small group. And if you think about all of the IT that's purchased through the university, it's impossible for our little team to be involved in all of those purchases and to, to provide the accessibility consultation that we do. So when we do get involved, we tend to, um, uh, we evaluate products, we evaluate um, VPATs, which we're gonna learn about today. Um, and we have conversations with the service owner or manager, the people that are making decisions about what to, what to purchase. And we have conversations with the vendor. And so we get involved at a very deep level, um, but we can only do that um, you know, with really high risk, high exposure purchases. So that leaves, um, you know, probably Lynn could probably give you a number, but thousands I'll say of IT purchases that um, you know, sort of don't get subject to that level of scrutiny, but still put the university at risk um, if they are inaccessible and they're you know, groups of users who are unable to use those technologies. So, so the goal of this presentation then is to educate everyone, um, at least we've got 18 people here today, but we're, we're recording this session so it'll be available and I encourage you to spread the word. But everybody who makes a purchasing decision needs to know at least a little bit about how to evaluate the responses that vendors come back with when we ask, is your product accessible? So we're gonna talk mostly about that step two today of evaluating the responses received from vendors and trying to get some sense of whether a product is accessible. So as we're talking about these things, we, we are gonna use um, the acronyms that are shown on this slide. Um, the W3C, that's the World Wide Web Consortium, the organization that owns many of the web standards. Um, HTML, CSS, um, as well as the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which is the second bullet, um, abbreviated WCAG, um, some, sometimes pronounced a little differently than that, but that's how um, I pronounce it. And those are the standard for accessibility. And we'll talk more about those um, at a considerable uh, length. Also, the W3C owns the ARIA specification, um, that stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications, and we'll talk about that in depth as well. And finally, we're uh, the kind of the, the focus of a lot of what we're talking about is the Voluntary Product Accessibility Template, or VPAT, which is the tool that vendors use in order to communicate how accessible their product is. So when you, with step one in that three-step process, ask for accessibility information, Typically, when you do that, a vendor, if, if they know anything at all about accessibility, their response is going to be a VPAT that they have already prepared. In many cases, uh, smaller vendors are not familiar with this, and so it may be new to them. Um, but that ultimately is what they provide, because that's what we ask for. That's part of the, um, the terms and conditions we actually specify that a VPAT is the way to communicate whether your product is accessible or not. 
So this is actually a quote from UW Procurement Policy 7.2.15. Um, and it also is um, included on that page that was linked uh, from the uh, lens first slide, uh, uw.edu slash accessibility slash procurement. Um, this is um, the actual language um, that's included in the policy. And that is University of Washington bidders and vendors shall be required to demonstrate that information technology provided to the University of Washington conforms to or addresses each of the W3C WCAG 2.1 level 2A success criteria wherever demonstrating such performance is practicable. Vendors may do so by providing a VPAT using VPAT 2.3 or higher and then it goes on to talk more about um, some specifics related to the VPAT. So we're going to explore all of this um, on uh, future slides. But essentially, this is just sort of laying it out there. It's part of the policy that we need to meet WCAG 2.1 level 2A. That is our standard for IT. And the means by which we expect vendors to document that is with a VPAT specifically using VPAT 2.3 or, or higher. And the relevance of that I'll talk about in a moment. So let's define some of these terms. WCAG 2.1, uh, you already know now that WCAG is Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. 2.1 is the most recent version. This is an international web accessibility standard and it's been around actually for a very long time. It's not a new, a, a new thing. The, um, the web was invented by Tim Berners-Lee in the early 1990s, and soon thereafter, he formed the World Wide Web Consortium, the W3C, and soon after that organization was formed, they became aware of the fact that the web could um, erect barriers for people. And this was not the vision at all. They, they had intended for the web to be the great equalizer that provided information at its, you know, everyone could have information at their fingertips, which, um, you know, was unlike anything that had ever happened before. And the fact that this could actually shut people out and could cause accessibility problems was not at all consistent with their vision. So very early on in, after the organization was formed, they formed a subgroup called the, this is another acronym that's not included in my list, but the WAI, the Web Accessibility Initiative, which then began working on the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So they published version one in 1998. And then every 10 years after that, they have, they have released an upgrade. So uh, it's a long process, involves a lot of stakeholders and a lot of, a lot of discussion a lot of vetting of the ideas that are generated from those discussions, a lot of research. And um, ultimately, they went from 1.0 to 2.0 by 20, uh, 2008, and then uh, an incremental upgrade to 2.1 in 2018. And that's where we stand today, 2018. Uh, the version that was released a few years ago is the current version, version 2.1. And within that, um, there are there are broad concepts, and within those concepts, there are guidelines, and within those guidelines, there are success criteria. So the the lowest level um, is success criteria, which are sort of a checklist of the details of how you make IT accessible. And I'll say IT because even though the W in WCAG is web, they actually were written to be more generic, particularly in 2.0 and 2.1. They, um, they intentionally were trying to cover pretty much anything with a user interface. And so um, a lot of the issues that are identified in these success criteria are not just web issues, they're software issues. They're also applicable to anything, anything with a screen, you know, an information kiosk. Um, if it has a user interface, then some success criteria within WCAG apply to it. So each of the success criteria, and there you know, again, this is where the details lie, and there are 78 success criteria, so quite a, quite a few things to know about. Um, each one of those is assigned a level, and uh, level A is the highest level. These are the highest priority, the most critical things 
that are going, going to absolutely affect users and block them from, from having access if these success criteria are not, um, not addressed. Um, there, there also is some consideration for difficulty. So as they were coming up with the various levels, um, the, they were assigned based both on severity and difficulty. So you, you have some things that drop to a lower level, not because they're unimportant, because, but because they're more difficult to implement. Level 2A are kind of the mid-level um, success criteria, and then level 3A are either less critical or more difficult. So um, early on when WCAG, particularly WCAG 2, when it was released with this um, level A, 2, and 3A um, sort of system for, for tagging success criteria, there were a lot of questions about, you know, how accessible is accessible enough, you know? Um, are we supposed to just meet level A or level 2A or, or all 78 success criteria? There are a lot of open questions about that. And um, since that was 2008 when 2.0 came out, you know, we've had a lot of years to sort this out. And there have been a lot of legal complaints, including legal complaints against higher education. And um, that has all, both within higher education and without, all signs indicate that level A and 2A are the expected level that, that we will meet. This comes out again and again and again in settlements and resolutions, and it has found its way into policy and so it's become very clear now that uh, WCAG 2.1 level 2A is the benchmark. That's what we need to strive for. If we also meet level 3A success criteria, that's great. But what we're gonna be held accountable for are the level, level A and level 2A success criteria. So to give you a sense of what, um, what these are exactly, um, we need to look at some, some specifics. And 78 may seem daunting. Um, and my goal here is to simplify. So um, anybody who's making purchasing decisions, again, needs to be able to evaluate a product at some level for accessibility. And it's unreasonable for, for each of those people to become an expert at the level of understanding all 78 WCAG 2.1 success criteria um, it's just not going to happen. So I think there are three that are particularly important um, within the context of reviewing VPATs. And so, so let's focus today on just those three. The first is 1.3.1, uh, that is info and relationships. And that is a level A success criteria, so the highest level. And this is important because it encompasses so much that is so critical when we're talking about accessibility that um, headings, for example, need to be coded as headings. So you got big bold text that is the main heading of a, of a page that needs to be coded as an H1. And secondary headings, subheadings within that need to be H2. If there's a deeper level of headings, so you've got subheadings, new sections within the, the level two heading sections, then those would be H3. And so the idea with headings is they form an outline of the content. So that falls under this particular success criteria, as does all these other things related to um, uh, semantics, as we often say in, in the web development world, that you use tags that specifically state what this thing is and what its relationship is to all the other parts. So form fields is another example where you've got labels for form fields and a sighted user can see that relationship because of proximity, but um, having it properly tagged ensures that people who can't see and are using a, a screen reader to access content either audibly or using braille they get those same relationships. So the label is actually attached to the form field. That all happens behind the scenes in the code. Um, same thing with accessible table markup. If you've got a really big table, lots of rows and columns, then a person who has no eyesight, they're reading that with a screen reader linearly going across a row and then down to the next row and then down to the next row. 
Um, that can be really daunting to try and figure out where you are. But if the table is marked up appropriately and you've got columns that are explicitly identified as columns, then, uh, or as table headers, column headers, or row headers, then you know that helps a screen reader user to stay connected with all the parts and to understand exactly where they are at all times within that table. So the, all those sorts of things, headings, labels on form fields, accessible table markup, that's all you know using the, the, the tagging environment. Um, it applies to websites, it applies to PDF documents, it applies to Word documents using that structure, that, um, that semantic um, tagging in a way that is accessible, that all falls under info and relationships. So that's why that's so critical. It arguably is the most important accessibility issue. The second success criteria I wanna focus on is accessibility by keyboard. This also is level A, so it too is super critical. But I've included this one because it's so easy to understand and so easy to measure. It um, basically means all functionality is operable through a keyboard interface, so not using a mouse. So if you've got something, for example, a common example is a drop down menu. If you've got a navigation menu on a website and you hover over a top level menu item with a mouse, a sub menu appears, then that is um, you know, perhaps dependent on that mouse hover. So how does it work for somebody who's using a keyboard? Can that keyboard user tab to the submenu, or tab to the menu, and can they trigger the display of the submenu? And then can they navigate through the submenu and access all of its parts? So anything that a mouse user has access to, a keyboard user should have access to as well, because not everybody can use a mouse. Um, there, you know, of course, we've talked about screen reader users, people who are using a non-visual interface. They are not going to be mouse users, typically. Um, but you also have people who physically are unable to use a, a mouse. And therefore, they may be using some other sort of assistive technology, or they may just be using the keyboard, pressing tab to navigate through an application and other keys as makes sense. Maybe enter or space to click a button, um, maybe the arrow keys to move through something, um, up or down or um, a left or right, maybe escape to close something that pops up. Those are all sorts of keys that are often supported within an accessible interface. So it doesn't require any assistive technology, it doesn't require any accessibility checker tools or anything like that to test for keyboard accessibility. And so that, that is why this is here. The third success criteria is name, role, and value. This is 4.1.2. This two is a level A issue. And that basically means when you have more than just a digital document, but you have a web application where you have things changing dynamically on the screen in response to user behavior, then that calls for ARIA um, and you know, other, other techniques and technologies, um, but uh, ARIA is a specification from the W3C that makes accessibility possible when you have a dynamic application like that. And so um, since so many of the, the tools that we are purchasing are web-based applications, and do these days have a lot of interactivity that happens on the page in response to user behavior, ARIA is invariably a necessary ingredient to making those applications accessible. So it's really important to at least understand what ARIA is. ARIA is complex, so it's not, it's not reasonable to, under, to expect anybody making a purchasing decision to be an ARIA expert. There are few ARIA experts. But it's important to understand what it is and what, what function it plays in the overall scheme of things. So I actually want to spend a little more time to um, just to provide that, a basic background of what ARIA is. It, again, stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. It is a W3C specification. So it is markup. 
that gets added to HTML to improve the accessibility for assistive technology users. So where HTML can do the trick, then it's good enough. You don't need ARIA. Um, but there are places where HTML does not adequately communicate what's happening in, in an interactive application. And therefore, ARIA needs to be added in order to establish those communications. So let's look at an example. And I apologize if any of you are not coders, but this is a really simple HTML example. So hopefully it'll be clear. But essentially, we have two HTML elements here. One is a button, and one is a div. And the div contains some content that, in this case, just says this section contains more info. It has an ID. So what happens is when somebody clicks on the button, which says more info, somebody clicks on that button, then that changes the div so that it, imagine that it is hidden by default. They click more info, that div then becomes visible. So in response to clicking on the button, something has changed on the web page. So this is a very simple and very common sort of interface element in on web pages and web applications, hiding things by default and then exposing them when a user clicks on something. Um, but it's not accessible. If a screen reader user who can't, can't see the page, um, they land on the more info button and it says button more info. They know that's a button. They know that if they click on it, something's going to happen. But then they click on it, which they would do by pressing the space bar or the maybe the enter key. And, and then this div appears, it becomes visible, but they have no idea that it just became visible. They have no idea what just happened or where. Um, it's just silence. So they click on the button, nothing happened. They click on the button again, again, nothing happens. So they're, they're confused and they're lost. The only way to make that accessible is with ARIA. And in this case, it's just two ARIA attributes that get added to the HTML. One of those is ARIA controls. It's ARIA-controls equals and then the ID of the section that is being controlled by that button. So you're establishing an explicit relationship between the button and that section of content. The other is aria-expanded, which is either true or false. So it's true if the content is visible, that content is expanded, or it's false if the content is hidden. And then that just gets changed with JavaScript when somebody clicks the button then the value of RE expanded changes and the screen reader then passes that on to the user to let them know the content has changed um, or that the, the item has, has expanded or it has collapsed. And, and then through ARIA controls, the screen reader, um, it's not super well supported by assistive technology, but JAWS, the most popular screen reader does provide a means to jump directly to the controlled content. So once it says you know, expanded, they can jump right to that that content that has just appeared. So um, so that's a you know a simple example. Um, just to give you an idea, again, you don't need to memorize you know, ARIA attributes, ARIA controls, ARIA expanded. If you're a web developer, that's all good stuff to know. But as somebody making a purchasing decision, you just have to know that ARIA is important for any sort of dynamic web application. So you've got three success criteria under your belt now. And that leads us then to evaluating a product for accessibility. So a vendor has been asked um, to provide some documentation of their accessibility. They provide us with a voluntary product accessibility template or a VPAT. And this is a standard means by which IT vendors can provide documentation on whether and how they meet accessibility standards. It's been around for a long time. And um, there are various versions of this. And they originally were built um, based on old Section 508 of the Rehab Act standards. These, this was an accessibility a law that required, um, still does require, federal agencies to ensure that their IT is accessible. 
Um, but the original set of accessibility standards for Section 508 were published around 2000 and are very old and are not WCAG 2.1. So we are required um, to meet WCAG 2.1 level 2A. And if they provide us with a VPAT based on old Section 508 standards, that's not going to answer our question about how their accessibility, how they do on accessibility as measured by WCAG 2.1. So, um, so they need to provide a reasonably current VPAT that addresses WCAG 2.1 conformance. And the, uh, the earliest version to do that was VPAT 2.3. So it needs to be at least based on 2.3. Um, the latest version um, is VPAT 2.4, which has some enhancements over 2.3. There are also, within the various versions, there are multiple additions. And um, this should be hopefully clear if they're, they're trying to document um, that they, how, how well they meet WCAG 2.1, then they will fill out the WCAG 2.1 edition, um, not the Section 508 edition, not the European Union edition. They could fill out the international edition, which encompasses all of those standards, including WCAG 2.1. But ultimately, what we need to know is how well they meet WCAG 2.1. So we did have a question in the chat, um, a good one from Jeremy Thompson, asking if it would be appropriate um, to include VPAD information, what, our, what it, it is and what standards are required under our corporate social responsibility section for suppliers looking to do business with the UW. Um, and basically what Jeremy's asking is the procurement team, my team, has corporate social responsibility section on our website for suppliers. And would it be a good idea to put our requested VPAD information there? And I think that's a great suggestion and something we could probably talk about offline. Excellent. Thanks for bringing that up, Jeremy. And thanks, Lynn, for, for being the person who can make that happen, right? Or at least get the conversation started. Yes, I'm, I'll talk to our content owners there as well and um, see if we can get a consensus on that. That would be great. Cool. All right. Um, are there any other questions actually right now before we get into looking specifically at the VPAT? That's what's going to happen next is we're going to do a deeper dive into the VPAT form. Not seeing any in chat right now, but if anybody has any, feel free to post them. And oh, we have one. Um, has Terrell's team looked at providing accessibility review as a service? Um, we sort of, and we do that informally as a service, not as a formal service, but this is a large part of what we do. Um, but there we do sort of have to consider um, the fact that we are uh, maxed out. And so there's kind of an informal process by which um, you know, we take into account the, the level of risk. And so um, typically we review products when it reaches a level where you know, this is gonna affect a lot of people or potentially it's gonna affect a lot of people, students, faculty, staff, visitors, um, the more of an impact it's going to have, then the more likely it is that we'll um, take it on. But well, I want to be clear that I wasn't expecting you to do it for free and that it might be a capacity building uh, service in the sense that if you charged for it, then you would have more capacity to do it. Right. Yeah, there definitely are conversations about that, but we don't, uh, not offering that as a formal service at this point. Okay, any other questions before we move on? All right, if not, uh, well, this is a blank VPAT. This is a 2.3 WCAG edition, and we've got three columns. So there's a criteria column, a conformance level column, and a remarks and explanations column. And the criteria column consists of uh, WCAG 2.1 success criteria. So looking down through the list here, we see the ones that we've talked about, 1.3.1, um, info and relationships, 2.1.1, keyboard, 
Um, and in, uh, this screenshot doesn't go far enough to include um, the, uh, the one about ARIA, but you can kind of see what some of the others are as well as you look through that. Um, what, um, how this is supposed to be filled out is, um, you've got one row for each WCAG success criterion. The conformance level column is a multiple choice column. And so, and this is clearly spelled out in the instructions that the expected answers there are either it supports, so the product supports the success criterion, it partially supports it, which means some of the functionality of the product does not meet the criterion, but maybe overall it does does not support means the majority of the product functionality does not meet the criterion or it might be not applicable or it might not be evaluated um, it's always great to say i don't know if you truly don't know and a lot of vendors try to try to sort of fudge through this and fill it out without really knowing um, and you know we're going to look at several examples that sort of help us to judge how competent a, a vendor has been in filling out this form. Um, also, that third column is arguably the most critical, that this is where we learn the details of exactly how their product supports or does not support or partially supports the success criteria. So um, that is there to provide detail. And in the end, we should have enough information to make an informed decision about this, this product's accessibility and the amount of risk we're going to be taking on if you know, there are certain groups of people who can't use it. There's also required metadata at the top of the form. And again, the instructions are very clear. They, they actually say in the instructions, there are 11 required fields. Um, there are five of those in particular that I think are the most critical for our purposes. And those are the a name of the product and the version number. We want to know which version they're um, basing this report on. We want to know the date of the report. And we want to contact information for follow-up questions. And that's not just a generic help email address, uh, which sometimes uh, vendors will provide in that, that form field but we want somebody specific who can answer accessibility questions and somebody filled out this form. And so that's the person who should be identified um, in, uh, in that form field. Also evaluation methods used. What techniques or what methods did you use in order to come up with the answers that you provided? And what are the applicable standards or guidelines? And that should be, if they're using the WCAG 2.1, um, VPAT, then that is the applicable standards. And so that should be self-explanatory, but it is important to ex explicitly state that. So we have a, oh, we have a go. good question in the chat right now. Okay. Um, is a VPAT similar to a personal data processing agreement in that once a vendor agrees to a VPAT, it is only good for that specific purchase with that specific department? Um, or can it be used with another department if they use the same vendor? And that sounds like a question for you, Lynn. Well, I would say that kind of depends um, on how we word the VPAT language in the contract. Um, I would say that if you know the departments are all agreeing to, if they're all buying the same product, the v, basically the product in the VPAT will be the same for all of the departments. Um, but the accessibility standards they agree to in the contract are individual for each contract um, and are negotiated in the contract. And so if one department says, we agree that whatever your VPAT says looks good, um, that contract language doesn't transfer over to another department. Um, they could use that same contract language if they wanted to, um, and they could point to the same VPAT if they wanted to. Um, but I think it's, probably not a blanket statement that will apply across departments as to the level of accessibility they want to agree to in each of their agreements. It seems like, um, and I'm a, I'm a procurement outsider, Lynn's a procurement insider, uh, but it seems like from my perspective, there, there is a lot of sort of um, siloed 
uh, purchasing that happens. And so the same product uh, licensed by a number of different groups within the university a lot of times. And the process is different for all of them. And I, I can think of one case in particular where it was the same product or the same service and uh, the same VPAT, um, but different decisions reached as to what to do with that information. And so one group decided this is too big of a risk and we're not going to, we're not going to proceed any further because they can't address their accessibility problems. And the second group decided they're willing to take on that risk. Um, it, it wasn't that, that big of a concern to them. So ideally, I think we would be on the same page. You know, everybody, you know, it would be more sort of centralized and, and you know, if a company cannot demonstrate accessibility and cannot commit to improving their accessibility, then that should be, you know, a stance that we as a university take um, that, um, you know, our policy is that everything has to be accessible and therefore we can't proceed to do business, you know, with a company that's going to put us at risk. But when you got, you know, the right hand saying no and the left hand saying yes, then that, that sort of sends mixed messages to the vendor. That's my perspective as a procurement outsider. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Lynn. <laughs> yes, I don't want to hijack your part of the presentation with procurement stuff, but um, what can happen with some vendors is that, you know, a lot of them will give you their standard boilerplate contract. Um, and Jeremy was in procurement for a long, long time, much longer than I've been in, so he knows too. And so they'll give you their standard form and it'll have nothing in it whatsoever about accessibility. And so a department will do the right thing and they'll go, okay, procurement, take a look and we'll say, oh, you know, we need to have accessibility commitments from them and let's talk about liability and all the other good procurement stuff. And um, we'll get them to negotiate that. And then days, months, weeks, years later, they'll go to another department and they'll say, here's our standard boilerplate. And the other department will either um, perhaps go rogue, which is not recommended, or they'll say, oh, you know, we need this, you know, it's buying them clothes. We need this in one hour. We can't be bothered with any of that. We're going to waive it all. And so if they do that, what the other department, all that good stuff the other department got into for their contract for accessibility will not apply to the other department um, and it will not transfer over. And so if the vendor has accessibility issues with department A that did the right thing, um, then we can actually have, we have recourse to have that vendor remediate their accessibility and fix it um, and not be responsible for that ourselves. Whereas department B does not have that recourse. And if the vendor does not have anything accessible, they have no requirements whatsoever. And so essentially each new contract is a brand new day with accessibility language, unless we use a master contract that procurement has negotiated, but individual department contracts currently not. So anyway, thank you, Terrell. You're welcome. And I saw, as you were explaining that, I saw the number um, uptick on the chat. Was that a follow-up question or? Yes, Jeremy said he appreciates the clarification and it would help if there were a means to track vendors who have already agreed to one. So it's possible to have a head start in negotiations if another department uses the same vendor. And it would, I know some departments are looking at tracking licenses and other items. And that's another reason why it's often good to go through procurement as soon as possible because what we can do for you is in the example I gave, if the vendor is giving us pushback on terms, we can say, well, you know, you agree to it with department A and that's the least we're going to take. Um, you know, we already have set a standard for terms and conditions and we know it's possible. So, you know, we want at least that level of protection in any other contract we sign with you. So we can at least, if we can't, um, do anything else, we can at least try to standardize it and get to the right person who can do that. And currently that's, you know, sort of on us and our records to do that. But as Jeremy indicated, it would be very nice to have some type of database for a lot of these terms as well. Indeed. Come on, nice. come on financial transformation. So. <laughs> yep. Yep. I, I second that. Okay. So, um, 
So let's look look a little closer at this VPAT then. We've got three columns um, and we've got required metadata. And so we have a general idea of how, you know, how this is structured and how it is supposed to be filled out. Um, and so a quick guide to reading a VPAT, um, you could ultimately um, you know, look at it in depth and really try to understand the inner workings of this product and get a better sense of how accessible it is and what the problems are and that ultimately is what should happen but often you can learn a lot just by following some really quick steps and you don't have to do dig any deeper because you learn so much just from these quick steps um first of all did they include all required metadata so again there are 11 required fields five required fields on my list um did they did they provide all that if they didn't then that's kind of telling, you know, perhaps just in their ability to follow instructions, but I think it also gives us a clue as to whether they're familiar with this form or not. If they're cutting corners and not, not filling it out properly and not providing all the required information, then that in and of itself, um, since, you know, a, a, uh, uh, an implied message about their commitment to accessibility, I think. Um, so related to that, did they fill the form out properly? Um, again, conformance level is a multiple choice question. If they entered something else in that column, they don't understand um, the, how the form works. And uh, finally, this is where a lot of vendors fall short. The remarks and explanation column is key to us understanding the limitations of the product. And so it needs to be sufficiently detailed so we can make an informed decision. And if they provide very little detail in that column um, and we still are left with lots of questions, then um, that's not, it's not correctly filled out. Um, that said, it really is impossible for a single form to tell us everything we need to know about a product. And so this is a conversation starter. A VPAT is not the answer to whether a product is accessible, it is um, the start of a conversation that you can have with the vendor. And so part of what we, what we wanna explore here, uh, as we look at sample VPATs, you know, what, what can we learn from these VPATs and what follow-up questions emerge from what we see here, things that we need to know more, more information about. So the third step then is to look a little closer um, at just a few specific success criteria. So just to simplify things, you can hone in on these three success criteria that we have talked about. Because you know, if you have now a basic understanding of those three, then you can see how they responded to those three and see if their responses make sense. And as you're doing that, questions to ask yourself are, uh, first of all, who completed this VPAT? Um, sometimes vendors will have an independent accessibility consultant do that for them. And that, that is preferred because they, even though they're getting paid, they, they are independent. They do um, presumably have no bias and they're gonna give us, give us an honest evaluation. Um, did they follow the instructions? Again, that, um, that does communicate something about their commitment if they, if they just sort of blazed through it and didn't pay attention to the details. Um, do they seem to be knowledgeable of accessibility? Or are their answers to the prompts a little off? Like they don't really seem to make sense as you understand um, the success criteria. And ultimately, after reading the VPAT, do you know more about the accessibility of the product? And after reading the VPAT, what follow-up questions do you have for the vendor? So some example questions that you might ask, um, not is your product accessible? Um, that is too generic and it's a yes, no question. And, and so um, probably if you're talking to sales, they're gonna say yes, and then they're gonna hope somebody can back them up with actual information. Um, but if we ask a, there are better questions to ask um, that can get better answers. For example, in your VPAT, you said this related to 1.3.1 info and relationships. Could you please elaborate on that? What are some specific examples of how your product meets this success criteria? Um, also, getting beyond just the product, and this is really important also, and looking at the company, because if, they, if they've just gone through and they have patched their accessibility problems for this one product, 
but it really isn't ingrained in their culture and it's not going to be part of their the product life cycle you know as it goes back around again um then you know we're going to be facing this problem again of you know inaccessible new products coming out of this company so we want a company that understands accessibility and is committed to it and we know that as we continue to do business with them over time it's going to be a productive and positive relationship with accessible products and services as as a deliverable so to get into that, these are more sort of human questions, not technical questions and not requiring accessibility expertise, but just tell us how your company addresses the need for accessibility throughout the product lifecycle. And what is your methodology for testing your products for accessibility? Who does that testing? Which tools and assistive technologies do you use? What sort of training do your designers, engineers, and quality assurance personnel receive on accessibility? And I'll tell you from, from experience, there are some companies who can answer these questions. They sound like really hard questions, like we're trying to stump the vendor, but um, there are some that could elaborate extensively on, on all of these. Uh, we're actually using, right now we're using Zoom, and so that's a good example. Um, where they could they could go into great depth about um, yeah all of these questions and they they have a committed accessibility team which actually includes quite a few UW grads um, who have worked um, three people who have gone on from being students on our team uh, have gone on to work for Zoom as part of their accessibility efforts um, but um, and that's there are many other examples too of vendors who understand accessibility and have integrated it into their culture. Um, but there also are a lot of companies that um, are not, not so mature when it comes to accessibility. Um, and it's pretty easy to, to spot that. So here's, here's an example. We have six examples that we'll, um, we'll have a look at here. Um, the first is a two column VPAT. And we know that this is supposed to be a three column report. They've left off the most critical column of all, didn't provide us any remarks or explanations about their claims here. So they've got a few things that they say they partially support, um, other things they say they support, but regardless of what their answer is there, we need to know the details and they didn't provide the details. And these are all actual real world VPATs that we've looked at over the last year. Here's another one that have they have a remarks and explanations column but there's um the only time they filled that column out is when an item was not applicable which is probably the only time they really don't need anything in that column all the others should have some details they didn't provide those details so both of these are you know examples of bad vpats that um should you know if if they're, you're comparing products and you know you've got product A, B, and C, product A and B um, have actual VPATs that you know follow the instructions and include information that's meaningful, um, and otherwise the products are are equivalent, then I you know I would toss out product C for a VPAT like this. Um, example three. Here we have an actual answer to the keyboard success criteria. And they say it partially supports. And they say all functionality of the content is operable through a keyboard interface without requiring specific timings for individual keystrokes. So they've accurately described, sort of paraphrase, paraphrased the success criterion. So they know what they're talking about, it seems. Then they say, however, there are minor exceptions. For example, and so this is where the, the detail comes in. Uh, what are the exceptions? This is the kind of thing that we want because now we can we can know, okay, not just that some things are not going to be accessible with the keyboard, but what things are those and how critical are they to the functionality of the application? So the exceptions are the calendar widget on the manage section is not keyboard operable. However, alternatively, the date can be directly entered into the date field. So, um, so first of all, if they hadn't included that however statement, they just said the calendar widget is not accessible with the keyboard, then my follow-up question would be, how critical is that calendar widget? If everything else is accessible by keyboard, the only thing that a person who can't use a mouse can't do is access that calendar widget. How critical is that to the functionality of the product? 
But they've actually answered this, that there is an alternative. If a person can't access the calendar widget, they can enter the, the date directly. So not really a problem. They've, got, they've identified a minor problem, but they've also identified the solution. So this is a really good example. Um, I'm, I would be pleased with this response. Here's one uh, with that uh, 4.1.2 name role value success criteria. So this is the ARIA um, success criteria. And they say their product partially supports this. The web application provides the correct name, role, state, and other important accessibility information for most form controls with the following exceptions. So similar to the one we just saw, it says there are some exceptions and here are the exceptions. Um, dynamic filter results are not announced to screen reader users. Some calendar widgets are not using appropriate roles. And this actually goes on and on and on and on. It's a very lengthy list of exceptions. And uh, so the issue I have with this is, is this truly partially supports? It almost seems like, you know, if you've got, you know, there is kind of a fuzzy line between partially supports and does not support. But when you reach a certain number of exceptions, they sort of become the rule rather than the exception. And so I would argue that maybe this is actually does not support, but it might be worth having the conversation with the vendor. They do seem to understand the success criteria. And so, you know, I trust their evaluation here and I trust their reporting and I appreciate the transparency of their reporting, but, um, but I wanna know, you know, more about how critical all these exceptions are. Cause it sounds like there's so many of them. It sounds like it's gonna be really hard for somebody who's using assistive technology to perform the essential functions of, of the job. So, and to remind you, we are, uh, I don't know that we actually talked much about laws and policies, but we do have a, uh, you know, the, all of the legal settlements and resolutions that say, you know, we need to meet WCAG 2.1 level 2A. And so that, that falls under the Americans with Disabilities Act and section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, so we are under federal law to ensure our programs and services are accessible. But beyond that, we have a state policy, policy 188, that specifically says all state agencies, including higher education institutions within the state of Washington, need to have IT that meets WCAG 2.1 level 2A. So it's spelled out there as well. Um, so, so we know that we need to do this. Um, but being realistic, very few products, if any, fully meet WCAG 2.1 at level 2A. Um, and, you know, that's, that's our goal. And our, our policy actually expresses that as a goal. That's our target. We are working towards that. Um, but it um, probably every vendor is going to fall short. And then the question becomes really just one of functional accessibility. How can a person who can't see, they're using a screen reader, how can a person who physically can't use a, a mouse, how can a person who is using speech input and controlling their computer entirely with voice, um, you know, how are they able to perform the functions that this product or service requires? Um, and for students, that means are they going to be able to perform the required functions of their curriculum? For employees, it's going to mean are they able to perform the essential functions of their job? And so, um, so then it's, it's a question of degree, of severity, and of level of risk that we're willing to take. Um, so if a product falls short in some areas, that's expected. But those can't be critical errors that are going to be showstoppers and prevent somebody, you know, some groups of users from being able to perform the essential functions made possible by this application. So the next example here has three success criteria. There's one for captions, there's one for audio descriptions, and both of those are video related. Um, and then there's the, the one we've been looking at, info and relationships. So I want to mention, I've included the first two here in the screenshot because they are not applicable. This is not a video product. And so captions and audio description are not applicable. And it says that in the remarks and explanations column. But they chose to express that as supports 
instead of not applicable. And that's subtle, but it's kind of like, you know, reading through advertising with a critical eye. Um, and, you know, to me, it could, this could be an honest mistake, but to me, it seems they chose supports intentionally because if you look at a VPAT and it has supports on, on almost every success criteria, that looks like a really accessible product. And so they're trying to spin it that way. Um, when in fact, it should be not applicable uh, for those two success criteria. So keep a critical eye as you're, as you're evaluating VPATs. On the info and relationships um, item, this is actually similar to a previous example where they have a very honest and transparent list of exceptions, um, but it's a very lengthy uh, list. And this actually goes on and on and on for several pages, all of the exceptions. And so again, I, you know, I question whether partially supports is the right um, label there. Um, probably it should be does not support, but that's a conversation that needs to, to happen. Uh, the final example goes back to the keyboard success criteria again. Um, they say that their product partially supports this and they explain why. Um, it's because users can operate all functions in the product using a keyboard through standard controls. A rating of partially supports has been given due to the following isolated issues that do not substantially hinder use of the functionality. And so that, you know, that again, I keep saying that's really the heart of my question is, does this hinder a person? Does it block a person, prevent a person from using the product if they can't do it without a mouse? And they say up front, no, it does not. I want to know more. And they provide more. They say the publications imports functionality is not operable with a keyboard alone. User, users may elect to not use this functionality and complete the task of entering publications manually. So that sounds okay, perhaps. They say that that's not critical, but I do want to know more. Um, is it really, you know, is the process of entering publications manually not using the publication import functionality, um, you know, is that equivalent? Or is it going to, does that mean that their job is going to take many hours more than it would take if that particular feature was accessible uh, with keyboard? If it's going to take many hours more, then it's not really equivalent. And, and then we want to have a discussion about that issue needs to be resolved. Um, the other thing is the rich text formatting toolbar functionality is not operable with keyboard alone, but keyboard shortcuts do exist. Um, and users may elect not to use this functionality. So the, the fact that keyboard shortcuts do exist seems to actually contradict the fact that it's not accessible with keyboard. I think if you can perform the same functions with a keyboard shortcut, um, then that is probably um, satisfactory for, um, you know, for making that accessible by keyboard or claiming that's accessible by keyboard. So, so I think probably that's not, that's not really a huge problem. But the other piece of information that's here in concluding their comments, they say a roadmap has been identified to remediate both of these known issues. So I want to see the roadmap. I want to know when they expect to fix those. You know, can we get a timeline for you know, what issues they plan to fix and by when? And that will really help us to evaluate our risk. Maybe, you know, maybe there's some critical issues that are included on that roadmap. And maybe we want to delay our deployment until they have um, satisfied those issues. Or maybe we want to um, make the, um, you know, are doing business with them contingent upon them fixing those issues and sticking with the timeline that they've identified in the roadmap. So it'd be great. And we've, we actually have some history of this. Um, and this is, you know, this falls to Lynn and, and crew within procurement services, but actually getting into the contract, you know, this roadmap incorporated by reference so that, um, you know, they are held accountable for meeting the timeline, you know, of, of the things that they have pledged to, to fix. And really that's the ideal scenario, I think, because so few products are fully accessible. There are always gonna be issues that, that need to be resolved. And so um, having a roadmap that you negotiate with the vendor that identifies the biggest priority issues and, and um, you know, documents a timeline by which we could expect those issues to be resolved. That really is the best um, outcome, I think. 
you not, we do have a question in chat. Good timing. Um, we have a question that says, do you find that if products aren't designed to, designed to be accessible from the beginning, then the VPATs are just disasters? Yeah, I think that probably, uh, that may be an oversimplification or it may not be. I think that probably is more, more often the rule rather than the exception. That there are a lot of products that, a lot of vendors that really don't, they have not thought about accessibility. That's the first time they've ever heard of accessibility. And that shows both in their VPAT and in their product. Um, and I can, can almost guarantee that if kind of the converse of what the question says, but if the VPAT is bad, if it's one of those, you know, like the, the VPAT with the third column missing, then the product is also going to be bad. Um, it's going to be a reflection of the fact that they really don't know anything about accessibility. So, so I, there definitely is a correlation there. I really liked your example about getting um, the roadmap into the contract. We've done that on a few of them and that's great because that way uh, we have recourse if the vendor um, falls off the map or doesn't do those type of things. And so, you know, we have repercussions and we have um, um, options basically in case they don't meet those timelines. And I think we have actually made payment contingent upon meeting the the goals within a roadmap if i'm not mistaken that happened with at least one vendor and i know of other institutions that have attained that too that's a difficult thing to to get a vendor to agree to but if they're confident in their ability to to pull off accessibility um, then they may in fact agree to those sorts of terms in order to get a contract with the university of washington because they want to do business with us but you know we'll pay you if you if you meet, you know, the the obligations uh, for an accessible product that you have outlined here, you know, these show stopping issues, if you, you know, fix those, then we'll pay you. Otherwise, we won't. Yes, that's, I am seeing that more and more. And it's a new concept for IT vendors. Um, it's starting to trend. It's very common in all other industries you know, especially service, consulting, construction, they're very familiar with that. Um, IT vendors are not as familiar with it, but ones who are transparent and honest about um, what they want to do and what they're agreeing to usually have no heartburn with it. Okay, well, any other questions? We actually didn't do too bad on time, just 15 minutes over the top of the hour. This, um, by the way, I don't know if you want to watch a rerun, <laughs> but uh, it will be, the video will be archived. It's going to be up on our um, Access Technology website in um, the webinar archives page. Um, there'll be a link to it from there, and that will include the, uh, the slide deck as well as the video. And so you could send, if there are other people that you work with who make purchasing decisions, and feel free to send them um, to the video as well so they can they can watch this and get the information. And I'll, I'll type that URL into chat as we're given a couple more minutes for questions if anybody has them. Hopefully that's the correct URL. I did it from memory. So if somebody wants to try it and see if it works, that'd be great. <laughs> If it work. Yep. Awesome. Just tried it and it worked. Okay. Great. Well, thanks everybody for coming. It was a great, uh, great conversation. Glad, glad it was cooler today to do this rather than having to do it in 100 degree heat. But hopefully, it's uh, this is useful information for you guys. Thank you, Terrell.